call Senate Finance Committee to order. Time is three minutes after 1 p.m., February 14, 2012. With me this afternoon is Senator Ellis, Senator Thomas, Senator Egan from the committee will be, there's other meetings going on, so some of the uh, senators will be coming and going to this process. We've been joined this afternoon with the resource uh, committer, committee. We have vice, or excuse me, co-chair, Senator Wagner, uh, Senator Wilkowski, Senator French, and the other members of the committee will uh, come into the room when, when they uh, have a break from their other committee meetings going on. This afternoon, we're going to continue on with the fourth part of four-part series with Dr. Pedro Van Meers. Um, and with that, we can ask the, Dr. Van Meers to uh, put himself on the record and take us through Section 4. And then there's an uh, addendum at the end of, of this presentation he'll do. That's uh, four or five slides. And then we'll have him do a wrap-up. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Pedro Van Meers. I'm president of Van Meers Corporation, involved in uh, analysis of fiscal systems. Um, this afternoon, the idea is to wrap up uh, how you would use the architecture that we uh, discussed for existing oil and new oil. How could that be applied to heavy oil, shale oil, and natural gas in such a way that you get a relatively totally, uh, in total, a relatively easy, understandable uh, system. Uh, for heavy oil, uh, uh, what is important is to realize, of course, that uh, we cannot just, although I mentioned that uh, the um, uh, matter of, of that, that you need the heavy oil uh, to fill the line, uh, there are, of course, restrictions uh, probably technical restrictions on how much heavy oil you can put in the line versus how much light oil. Um, and consequently, there are probably, um, uh, in bringing uh, about uh, heavy oil production, uh, you would have to uh, think about uh, what to do in conjunction with additional heavy oil production in order to um, uh, ensure that the total gravity, the total quality of the line, crude in the line, is adequate for transportation. Uh, you can, of course, mix it with condensates. You can uh, uh, <coughs> increase the light oil production. Uh, you can even use GTL from a GTL plant. Uh, so there are many, uh, there are many ways to do this. But it is important to to uh, realize that uh, it's very important to. Uh, balance the, uh, the quality of the crude in the line. So you cannot just boost heavy oil production. It has to be part of a broader uh, plan. Maybe before we go to the next slide, we've been joined by Co-Chair Hoffman, Senator Stevens, and Senator Giesel has been in the room. She is also in the room all morning, in the morning session. And uh, we, noted, we noted that the Senate President is late, but since she's the President, it's okay. <laughs> go ahead and continue. Uh, oh, and uh, my apologies, uh, Mr. Chairman. There was an, uh, uh, I understand, there, there was a written question uh, uh, from uh, Senator Joe Pasquan um, about the breakdown of the 75% uh, in, in, of my, uh, uh, say, existing oil. I don't have a slide for that, uh, but it will absolutely be no problem to provide those uh, figures uh, uh, to the committee so that uh, tomorrow morning I, I will uh, make a special slide about the breakdown of, of the 75%, how it is broken down. Um, now, uh, in the new architecture, um, uh, my suggestion is that, as I indicated, that you need special terms for uh, heavy oil uh, with a lower uh, government take. Um, uh, the current heavy oil production, the current production, what is important to note is there is today already heavy oil production on the North Slope. Uh, about 40,000 barrels a day uh, uh, could be qualified as, as heavy oil production. Um, in principle, you could also apply the logic of existing and new to this heavy oil, 
I, I would not recommend it, uh, firstly because this is a small part of the production and it would unnecessarily complicate the system, uh, but more fundamentally it, it would be technically not that easy to de determine the, uh, the decline curve for heavy oil at this point in time uh, because uh, uh, many of the reservoirs are still, uh, say, in, in early development. And as I said, secondly, the volume is relatively small. So I, I think in the interest of, of keeping a relatively simple system, uh, I would propose not to divide the, the heavy oil in existing and, uh, and new, but simply make it one class of, of heavy, uh, heavy oil. That, of course, would result in a benefit, uh, an immediate benefit to those producers that are actually producing the, the heavy oil. Uh, here you see the terms I would produce, uh, I would propose. Uh, you can simply keep the same 25% PPT. You can simply keep the same 20% tax credit. You can also keep simply the same uh, severance tax feature. The only thing with heavy oil is you would start at a higher price, uh, $160 a barrel rather than 60, so that in case oil prices go up very high, uh, then you are protected uh, also uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, some price-sensitive mechanism. How do you then bring down uh, the government take on heavy oil without creating a ring fence. Now, that is very simple. My suggestion is to introduce what I call a 15% allowance. Now, uh, and the allowance is calculated on the va gross value of the heavy oils. Uh, how is that allowance calculated? Now, very simple. If the oil price is $100 a barrel, uh, they would be able to deduct $15 a barrel before you actually calculate the PPT. So this is an allowance before you calculate the PPT. So they would calculate the PPT based on $85 a barrel, and after that, everything uh, uh, applies. So all you do is one more line on your tax return that simply says, how much heavy oil do you produce? So many barrels, multiply it by 15% of the value, and that is an extra deduction. That is a very simple concept. Um, now, um, the problem, as I mentioned, the moment you start adding allowances to, uh, uh, to credits, the, the problem of a negative PPT uh, pops back up. And consequently, in order to avoid that the state would be out of pocket, uh, the best mechanism to employ is to employ a floor price and say if in the unusual conditions that the oil price drops very much and the state would be out of pocket, then we simply, just for the purposes of, uh, of calculating the PPT, not for uh, other purposes, and just for the purposes of, of heavy fuel oil, you would simply have a floor price. And you would say, okay, in that case, the heavy fuel oil component uh, uh, would uh, be calculated never on a price never lower than $55. This will guarantee that there will be always enough uh, revenues, I think, uh, to uh, uh, make up for the uh, tax credits and for the normal tax deductions. Now, this is an initial figure that I estimate uh, you, you need to do, of course, a little bit more work on this, uh, and you may be able to make it a little bit more sophisticated, but uh, if the moment you start giving in addition, just as the problem is the 40% tax credit, the moment you start going well beyond the 20% tax credit, you run into the negative PPT problem and uh, you have to deal with it somehow. And the easiest way to deal is it with it is a floor price. So, uh, so you would make two simple adjustments to the system for a new pr uh, oil production establish a 15% allowance and establish a floor price, and then you have a whole new system that is perfectly uh, attractive for uh, heavy fuel oil and brings you down to the government take level that we uh, discussed before. Okay. Senator French, you had a question? <coughs> Senator Wilkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Where do you suggest we measure that heavy oil in order to apply the uh, appropriate allowance? Right now we measure uh, oil downstream of all the production facilities. The drill sites gather the oil, they bring it into big production facilities, it uh, gets its water removed, the gas removed, and then we, we ship it out to the pipeline. We measure it at the, at the downstream of those production facilities. You know this, but yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, um, since the heavy oil would be joining that production stream somewhere uh, uh, above the production facility, uh, how are we going to measure this heavy oil? Now, the tradition in, in most uh, measurement practices around the world is that if you have, an, this would be field by field, so this, this is not part of a heavy fuel oil reservoir somewhere, uh, say, in a light oil field, or if the, the, the concept is that DNR would say, for instance, the Polaris the reservoir and field would qualify as heavy oil, all the oil from that facility uh, or from that uh, field would then uh, qualify as heavy oil. Uh, there may be some uh, areas uh, where you uh, would, may have difficulty measuring precisely. Of course, an oil company needs to know how much oil comes from certain fields because ownership is different than needs of the field. So they have to have a methodology for uh, calculating back uh, the proper, uh, the proper uh, 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 say, uh, volumes. If there is no measurement at the field, the practice all around the world is to uh, establish a, a very simple um, test separator and, uh, and uh, 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 do some tests in the field from which you can extrapolate precisely the production from that particular field. That would require an additional investment, but uh, that would certainly be worth it for this particular purpose. Anyway, it is good to know how much you produce field by field. Uh, I mean, that's pretty fundamental information. I do believe uh, that Alaska has sufficient technical capacity to, to identify that. Just a follow-up. Follow -up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that was a good answer. And, uh, and, uh, and I guess this is more globally. Uh, one of the difficulties I've had in thinking about your approach to this with different uh, tax rates for different uh, pools and so forth is the degree to which these are all sort of mixed up into one landmass on the North Slope. Um, you know, you're going to have you're going to have uh, existing light oil potentially coming uh, out of the ground, new light oil coming out of the same field. Uh, these fields also overlay heavy oil deposits, so you'll have heavy oil coming out of the ground, perhaps in different viscosities. And and so the, just the the practical sort of how how often is it in the world that you get these pools overlaying one another? It'd be so much easier, I guess, if they were just separate you know, in different areas where you've got heavy oil over here, you measure it, you apply a tax rate and so forth. But, but these are all going to be sort of intermingled. That's, that's my, my, my practical difficulty with this approach. No, uh, the, the firstly, uh, I'm not suggesting that, you know, you keep track of your varying, uh, say, uh, 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 gravity content uh, as you are uh, producing and that in any particular reservoir you could have layers of heavy oil and light oil. Uh, that would be horrendously complicated and, and I am not suggesting that. So I think that the easy way to do it is how most nations would do it. They would simply say this field or this entire reservoir will qualify as heavy oil even if there is a little bit of 24 degree uh, API in it but on average this seems to be a uh, heavy oil uh, reservoir you would set out criteria for how you qualify that so consequently uh, what you would do is uh, this is not something whereby you have to nervously look at your meter and, and, and from day to day it can vary from uh, you know light to, to, to heavy uh, what would happen is the entire field, uh, many of the heavy fields would be uh, separate fields, uh, others would be separate, uh, uh, clearly separate reservoirs. In some reservoirs, the top of the reservoir may be lighter than the bottom of the reservoirs. The total, you just have to make a classification. I think, uh, as you can see from my earlier slides, uh, it is already very well known, like Polaris, Schrader Bluff, uh, the Nukaichuk, it is already very well known uh, where the 
the big heavy oil pools are and where the big heavy oil fields uh, are. And uh, so consequently, basically, uh, I don't see much of a problem if you have an easy classification system for qualifying a total reservoir and a total field, either as heavy or as ultra heavy or <coughs> as light. Senator Wolikowski. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doctor, I'm trying to uh, reconcile your testimony today with some, um, and I don't know if it's different or if it's different circumstances, but, but it, it appears to me to be very different statements that you've made in the past about heavy oil and how, how you stimulate it. And one was a statement you, uh, a document you issued actually six years ago today, February 14, 2006. It was in Alaska. It's a proposal for a profit-based production tax for Alaska. And you concluded, quote, the fiscal proposal of a 25 percent tax rate and a 20 percent credit rate will provide a strong stimulus for heavy oil developments through the considerable downside price risk protection this system provides and the significant improvements in IRR and NPV at 10 percent under current long-term price projections. You added, there is no need for further incentives. Such incentives would unreasonably lower the revenues of Alaska for no significant added benefit in economic stimulus. Uh, that was in 2006, but then in April of this year, 2011, you, you issued a document called Gas Prices, Other Factors Indicate Changes in North American Shale Play Fiscal Systems, yes. where, you, where you made some recommended fiscal changes for North American jurisdictions. And in that document, you said, for large, unconventional, or high-cost resource projects, it can be recommended to introduce profit-sharing royalties or taxes similar to the Alberta royalties mm -hmm. for oil sands, the net profits interest for shale gas in northeast British Columbia, the royalties in New Finland and Nova Scotia offshore, or the petroleum profits tax in Alaska. Correct. So it appears that you're, is this an evolution of your opinion? Has your opinion changed? Am I, am I mis- reading what, what is being said here? No, you are exactly correct, uh, uh, properly correcting, and, and that is exactly what I mean. Uh, what I mean in that statement is that the PPT structure is entirely suitable for developing heavy oil. Uh, and so consequently, uh, the PPT structure as such uh, has worked, uh, is, is ideal over, say, a fixed royalty structure. And consequently, uh, for that reason, I originally already in 2006 recommended the PPD as I do now, because that is the proper architecture for uh, the proper architecture for for uh, developing uh, uh, heavy fuel oil. Uh, so consequently, uh, I'm. As you can see in my recommendations, I'm not changing the architecture that I recommended in 2006 and today. Uh, I think there have been, uh, there is now uh, clearly a different competitive environment than there was in 2006, as I have demonstrated in the first morning. Uh, you are now competing with, uh, as I mentioned, Alberta in a much more uh, stronger way. So in order to fit in the new environment, uh, you would have a new competitive environment. You now would have to be a little bit more competitive on your heavy fuel oil, uh, sorry, not heavy fuel oil, heavy oil, than you were in 2006 uh, uh, when Alberta was still uh, kind of emerging. So I think the reason that today I recommend adding in, in, in 2006, I said I thought you could do it with 25 and 20. Costs were a lot lower in that time, by the way. Uh, uh, so now with the higher cost and the stronger competition from Alberta, and not just Alberta, but also other uh, heavy oil uh, resources, I think you have to compete. And if you want to compete, uh, that is why I introduced now and uh, uh, propose to introduce the uh, allowance. But the structure in 2006 was fine. The structure that I proposed in six, uh, 2006 is fine. The structure is still fine today, uh, uh, provided you, you keep it simple, as, as, as I'm uh, proposing here. And today, unfortunately, you have to be a little bit more competitive than it could have been in 2006. Okay. Back to slide um, 90. One of the things that's not listed on here is the immediate write-off of capital expenditures and in, in, in your uh, concept dealing with heavy oil, I assume that that is to be included in this list with the 25% uh, uh, PPT base tax and the 20% credit? I am not recommending any changes in how capital 
uh, normal capital cost deductions are treated in the PPT, I think that that is adequate. Uh, uh, and consequently, I don't think there is a need to, to change that. Thank you. Okay, go ahead and continue. Okay. Now, how do you then produce the ultra-heavy oil? Uh, very simple. All you need to do is make one little change. As you can see, if I go to the next slide, only one number changes. Uh, you have to go from 15 to 25, and consequently, uh, 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 you have to, for this ultra-heavy oil, you have to uh, uh, be uh, more aggressive. I do believe that this would still result in a government take that is, that is somewhat higher than Alberta, as, um, as we discussed before. Uh, I think it is good to test the market based on this system. If you don't get takers, if there is no enthusiasm uh, for these terms, uh, for the ultra-heavy oil, eventually uh, you may have to look at lowering even the royalties, uh, as Alberta has done and as... Uh, uh, say, some other uh, nations have done. But I, I wouldn't recommend doing that immediately. I think it is very important to test the market uh, and by just making an attractive PPT uh, for uh, UKNU uh, style production. And uh, uh, if that doesn't seem to result in investors, then you can always take the, the, the next step but then you have at least the evidence that the terms need to be changed to, to attract further investment in the ultra-heavy oil. What is of immense importance, and I haven't heard much discussion uh, the, around Alaska on that, is, as I mentioned, uh, heavy oil um, uh, could uh, cause a significant problem uh, in the pipeline if you have too much of it. Um, Interestingly, of course, uh, Alberta is producing one and a half million barrels of ultra-heavy oil today. What do they do with this ultra-heavy oil? They actually put it in what is called an upgrader. Now, what is an upgrader? An upgrader actually looks like, an, like a large refinery, uh, but rather than uh, producing individual products like gasoline and diesel and jet fuel, in the upgrader, they just produce a mixture of, of light products, and that is called con, uh, synthetic crude oil. Uh, basically, what they do is they take the heavy fuel oil and split it into the oil in two components, coke and synthetic uh, crude oil. Synthetic crude oil is very good quality, equal in quality to West Texas Intermediate, 30, over 30 degree API, and you can put it straight in a pipeline. What do you use the coke for? The coke you use to fuel the plant. Very simple. So consequently, this is a way of actually converting heavy uh, oil into light oil, ultra-heavy oil, and Alberta is doing that, and that is how Alberta can send, uh, say, uh, currently synthetic crude oil uh, through the normal pipeline system all across uh, North America. Uh, so. Uh, I would recommend that uh, Alaska would also look at this for two reasons. Obviously, it is great value added to, to, to have that additional uh, step uh, within the state. Um, uh, secondly, that would completely solve the pipeline issues. Now you have a crude that is even better than the Alaska North Slope crude uh, going into the line. The Alberta arrangement, I would also suggest here, Alberta, in order to encourage uh, building upgraders in Alberta and, and producing the heavy crude, they permit what you could call a feed price uh, into the upgrader, whereby they say, okay, uh, the value of the ultra-heavy oil, and this largely applies to ultra-heavy oil or oil sands in the case of Alberta, the value of that crude we deem it to be 65% of the light oil coming out uh, so that the investor makes a margin of 35%, say, on that upgrading process. And on that upgrading process, you only pay corporate income tax, as if it is any refinery. Uh, so consequently, that way you pay your royalties, you pay your PPT on 65% of the value 
of the light oil coming out, and since ultra-heavy oil is way lower in value than uh, light oil, actually, uh, that is a good uh, concept. So that is the concept that Alberta is using. It has been used very successfully. Uh, as you know, Alberta is now uh, producing one and a half million barrels a day of synthetic crude oil uh, just on that basis. And that would solve an enormous problem with the pipeline. Now you have very light, very high value crude oil uh, that can go in that uh, line. Before we go to the next slide, uh, Senator Wilikowski has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How familiar are you with Alaska's corporate income tax provisions? Uh, my understanding is that because we don't have separate accounting that corporations are allowed to write off bad investments made elsewhere on their Alaska taxes. Uh, were you, are you aware of that? Does that change your Yeah, Alaska is, has a worldwide the, the system of taxation that is a, a little bit of cumbersome system of taxation. Um, and. Uh, uh, of course, uh, that would complicate the, the formula in this uh, uh, particular concept uh, for the uh, component in that particular case. If I could follow up, Mr. Chair, yes. would you recommend that Alaska move to uh, a separate accounting procedure? And, and let, me, let me just state real quick why. Um, number one, it wouldn't allow companies to, it would be a cleaner, like you just mentioned, it wouldn't allow companies to write off bad in, uh, investments made elsewhere. And it would also level the playing field between existing producers and new producers, because new producers probably don't have that. Uh, yes. In, in fact, as soon as I came to Alaska, I, I have always been in favor of calculating the Alaska portion of the, calcul uh, of the corporate income tax entirely on uh, the revenues and cost uh, attributable to Alaska and not to any other part of the world, because I think it messes up significantly uh, the Alaska possibility for uh, giving these kind of incentives, for giving these kind of uh, making these kind of rules, uh, allowing international companies to to benefit, it, it makes the tax system a very uh, a very cumbersome system to actually run. In fact, it is actually an obstacle to investment in in uh, Alaska because it is very difficult to explain to any newcomer how you have to even calculate your state corporate income tax. Uh, so. Uh, yes, uh, literally uh, from the first day uh, when uh, I worked for Governor Knowles uh, and until today, I, I have been a strong supporter for uh, uh, making sure that you calculate the, the, state por the state corporate income tax only on the basis of state revenues and costs that can properly be allocated to the state of Alaska, which gives you far more political freedom to pursue the interests of the state the way the state wants to do. Go ahead and continue. Uh, this is then the overview. Here you see very simply together all of the terms for oil. And, uh, for oil. Uh, the ACES as well as uh, uh, House Bill 110 uh, existing and new still on the slide. You can see how, how with just this simple allowance and just with this simple uh, uh, say variation of your severance feature, uh, and and of course, as you can see in the kink of the curve, the the uh, the floor price, uh, you can create a wide range of government take levels uh, within the PPT without changing the royalty, without changing the corporate income tax, and consequently, uh, you have an enormous flexibility to attract investment to just about every resource that Alaska has. Uh, and consequently, here you can see uh, that you can uh, achieve that just within the PPT system. Uh, as we discussed earlier, if you have to go down, if, it, if the market proves, if the market proves that you have to go down further, then the only additional step you can take is starting to lowering the royalties. But uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that initially. Uh, you may be surprised sometimes uh, by what investors are willing to do if you seem to have uh, definitely attractive terms for heavy oil. Uh, and consequently, uh, this would still compare unfavorably with uh, Alberta, of course, uh, but 
uh, definitely would compare favorably with some other major heavy oil producers like Colombia uh, and some other uh, par parts in the world. So consequently, uh, I think it would be good to test the market first on this uh, concept. Now, uh, shale oil, as I mentioned, uh, shale oil is still very iffy and, and we don't even know whether shale oil is producible at all. Um, my recommendation is, in view of the enormous risks uh, associated with shale oil, uh, to uh, give it the same terms as uh, ultra-heavy oil. However, with shale oil, we have to be a little bit careful to protect uh, the interest of the state uh, better. And uh, what are those interests? Uh, interestingly, in some shale oil deposits in North America, uh, the fracking and the quality of the oil and the productivity of the oil uh, turned out to be immensely favorable. And consequently, uh, some of the shale oil deposits are the most profitable wells in North America. And consequently, that may happen in Alaska as well. If that happens in Alaska, then you don't want to be as generous as I indicated uh, with the 44, 45 to 55% government take. Um, uh, the chairman asked already about other ways of, of creating progressivity. In this particular case, for the shale oil only, I think I would recommend introducing an R factor. What is an R factor? What does R stand for, by the way? That just stands for the word ratio. And what is that ratio? Now, that could be any kind of ratio, but usually it means something like cumulative revenues over cumulative cost, something that roughly indicates the profitability of the undertaking. And uh, consequently, I would recommend that in the case of shale oil, you make the allowance uh, subject to an R factor so that if it turns out that the shale oil actually happens to be quite profitable, uh, then uh, you don't lose government take unnecessarily. And consequently, uh, that would then be an automatic uh, correcting uh, mechanism. So uh, that would be one additional wrinkle, complicating wrinkle, as far as the shale oil is concerned, uh, for the purpose of uh, protecting the uh, Alaska state uh, if it suddenly, if, if there is this 5% chance that the shale oil turns out to be unusually profitable as some of the other uh, the deposits in uh, North America. For natural gas, uh, I would uh, uh, the, separate the gas in two groups, uh, new gas fields where you still have to uh, explore sometimes where you still have to develop the field. Uh, Top Point Thompson would be a good example. Um, and uh, say associated gas field, if you take Prudhoe Bay for instance, uh, all of the drilling costs, all of the field development costs have already been spent and actually producing gas from uh, Prudhoe Bay would be very low cost from a an, from an production point, uh, from my point of view. So I think you have two rather different, from an economic perspective, two rather different style uh, gas fields in the North Slope, the new gas fields and the associated gas fields. And I think you would need uh, different uh, terms for that. I would highly recommend uh, establishing terms for gas. Uh, I understand that the governor is not enthusiastic uh, about doing that, that he wants to wait what comes out of the discussions with the major oil companies. Um, uh, I would not recommend that. I would recommend that you were a little bit more aggressive uh, for two reasons. Uh, first reason is you don't necessarily want to depend only on the major oil companies for gas projects, and consequently it is good to announce to the world what your terms for gas is. Other people than the three major oil companies may be interested in gas development, and it is good to learn about that. So consequently, uh, I would not rely solely on the, on the major oil companies for uh, gas development. And therefore, I think it is very important to announce what your gas terms are. Um, also, I think it gives you a good bargaining position if you have to 
discuss terms with the major oil companies if you have terms on the books for gas, so that so that uh, oil companies know what it is that uh, the Senate uh, and the House found acceptable. Uh, so uh, I think it would strengthen the state's position if you if you uh, announce, uh, uh, say, a fiscal system for gas for those two reasons. Uh, for new gas, I think you have to be uh, very uh, attractive. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the only way at this point in time with the North American market in, in the doldrums, the only way to, to export gas uh, is now as LNG. Uh, basically, there are two concepts. Uh, one is to export LNG directly from the North Slope, competing with the Russians, and, and uh, ship it out in uh, LNG tankers. Uh, now, uh, I may be persona non grata in Fairbanks if I suggest that, uh, 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 but that is definitely a very uh, economic way of doing it, but politically probably unacceptable. Um, uh, the political acceptable uh, way to do it is, of course, do it through a gas line, but that may not be economic. So here we are again in an interesting uh, dilemma. Uh, so uh, nevertheless, new gas, bringing new gas on stream uh, uh, will be a major undertaking to be competitive. I discussed the, the ferocious competition in the, in the uh, Pacific. Uh, you really have to uh, be very aggressive if you want to get into that market. And consequently, uh, uh, that is why I would suggest a 25% allowance. Interestingly, the severance feature is actually somewhat tougher on a BTU basis because obviously if you get to a net back over $8 per million BTU, that is uh, anywhere a very attractive net back and uh, you should be able to introduce your uh, price sensitive feature there. Now you really need strong protection uh, in, in, uh, to protect yourself from negative PPT. So this would require a floor price for the gas as well as for the condensates so that uh, you are fully uh, protected. For the Prudhoe Bay gas, you don't need as much allowance as for the, uh, for the Point Thompson gas. A 15% allowance would be enough, I think. Uh, but uh, again, I like to condition this on the fact that uh, you, no matter what you do on the gas, uh, you will be in a very, very difficult and competitive position to bring uh, gas about. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the, I do uh, uh, recommend uh, as a first step to just modify the, uh, the PPT and not uh, yet uh, the look at other fiscal features. Uh, I think it is prudent to test the market first, see how investors react. Uh, if, it, if it turns out that you need to change terms uh, more drastically to get gas to market, then you can always uh, do that if the evidence is there that the terms that are defined don't seem to be uh, working. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Wolkowski. Thank you. Um, and maybe a question for the committee, or uh, if you can answer it, though, I would appreciate it, or maybe in the future. Um, I'd be very interested in getting a breakdown of government take. Uh, I've never, I don't believe I've ever seen that. Um, in, when you have a government take of 75 percent, uh, what percent is the state, what percent is PPT, or the, the progressivity, what percent is the royalty, what percent is corporate income taxes, property taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Have you done that? Oh, yeah, that's uh, in my model uh, to arrive at the 75, I have all these components broken out. So uh, uh, as I already promised, I will actually, uh, for all of the recommendations that I make for a particular price, say $100 a barrel, I will give for each recommendation exactly how it is broken down in the government take, so that you can see how it uh, works. And I will submit that to the chairman uh, tomorrow, so that you have all that information uh, immediately. Now, here you see on one slide, you can put the entire fiscal system for all these different resources together. All you need to do for every resource is 25% PPT, 
20% tax credit, that's the same for everything. And that allows you to consolidate throughout Alaska all of the resources uh, that Alaska has in one tax return. There is nothing simpler than that. The next step is that you have a severance feature. The only thing that you change for each of these resources is the base price, the increment, the change price, the next increment, and the maximum value. Uh, just different slopes for everything. But the concept would be exactly the same for each of the resources. Uh, then, in order to make heavy fuel, ultra heavy oil, shale oil, gas economic, you would introduce an allowance. The moment you introduce an allowance, you need a floor price to protect the state from negative uh, PPT. Then for the only resource uh, that could have a huge variation in profitability, the shale oil, uh, you would introduce an R factor uh, to adjust the allowance uh, with an R factor feature. As you can see, very simple. Uh, the whole fiscal system you can describe on one slide that's the only slide you need to show if you want to attract investors. This shows exactly what it is. Now, you then have to define a little bit uh, how you calculate the 25%, but it is a very, very simple system that would deal with uh, making all of the resources, gas, shale oil, heavy oil, ultra heavy oil, new light oil, existing light oil, everything under a simple concept uh, that is easy to implement, and now you can go out aggressively and say we are open for business. This is our list. This is our terms. If there are investors out there in Dubai, in Singapore, in London, uh, in Houston, uh, and if you're interested in these terms, come to Alaska and, uh, and become investor. Uh, we have a question from Senator Wilikowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious if you've had any discussions, conversations with, uh, or have any indi any indication from industry as to whether or not this would result in increased investment, and what what makes you believe that it would result in increased investment? Uh, no. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, I believe in the market, uh, and if I'm wrong, uh, you will learn very quickly because. Uh, if you put a nice brochure together, uh, I have been in many, many promotional visits around the world. If you put a nice brochure together and you say these are our terms and you have the governor speaking in Houston and in London and in Singapore and, and give presentations to investor groups, uh, you almost will know within days, definitely within a year, whether these terms are attractive, yes or no because if they look attractive, investors will come relatively quickly because many, there are about 200 oil companies in this world that are looking for opportunities, and if they think this is a good opportunity, they will come. Now, my experience in the world is if you do your homework and if you set your terms at the right term, investors will come. Uh, it may not be the big oil companies, it may be other oil companies, uh, but uh, I have seen many times, I've set terms and the major oil companies came in. So consequently, I'm relatively confident that that will work. We discussed th this morning how the major oil companies are in an extreme harvesting mode. Uh, or in other words, they are on their way out. Uh, and, and consequently, if you now start talking with them and say, what about doing a nice heavy oil project uh, uh, tomorrow, 10 years from now, then, then we look at that like, uh, like we are harvesting. Uh, so uh, don't interrupt us. Uh, so consequently, that, that is what Alaska has to deal with. And, and of course, to overcome that attitude will take time. But there may be all kind of other investors in the woodworks that may be very uh, interested in uh, those terms. These terms would be competitive terms, and my experience is if you offer competitive terms, investors will come from somewhere. Uh, maybe not the major oil companies, but others will come. In the case that they don't, what is the nice part of a market-driven system, the nice part of coming out with terms now you have all the information to adjust your terms further. Now you know for sure that in investors don't come for the shale oil terms, but they do come for the heavy oil terms. They may not come for the new gas fields, but they may be interested in something else. So now you have 
tested the market on very specific terms and you know what to do next if you want to promote uh, continuously the resources of Alaska. We have a follow-up for Senator Wolokowski, and then we'll go to Senator French and then Senator Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thomas Wagner, excuse me. And, and I'll just, I, I mean, first I want to make a comment, and the comment is this. Um, I don't want the public to be, um, uh, to, to, to think that no one's coming to Alaska. I, I don't think that's a fair representation. If you look at the number of companies doing business in 2007 when we passed ACES and the number of companies doing business now, we've, we've about tripled the number of companies. We've got uh, more exploratory wells on the North Slope than we've had in decades. So I, I wouldn't say people are not coming to Alaska under ACES. I don't think that's a fair representation. We've got all-time highs in investment as well. But uh, that being said, different, I mean, different consultants offer very different opinions, and, and we discussed heavy oil extensively under ACES. And, and the philosophy that we ultimately adopted, or the concept that we ultimately adopted was shown in a number of presentations by Gaffney and Klein by the administration, and it, it's, it's, the, it's the concept of portfolio blending. That is, uh, if you have field A, it's got a 25% tax rate, but it's got $30 in costs, and you have field B, which has a, um, $40 in costs, uh, it have a lower tax rate because it has higher costs. And so the philosophy behind ACES was by you encourage production in heavy oil, you encourage <coughs> production in the more expensive fields because the producers, by investing in those heavier oil fields or heavier cost fields, will lower their overall tax rate, will lower their effective overall tax rate. And, and it, it's not really, I don't think it's completely accurate to say that ACES is a net profits tax. It, it, it more is a tax that uh, taxes cash flow after reinvestment. And so it, it encourages reinvestment. And, and I think this is a fairly major deviation to go to your philosophy. I think it's different. I think it's, it, it moves away from the portfolio blending philosophy. And, do you, and I'm just curious to hear your, your opinion on that. Uh, no, absolutely correct. Firstly, I don't want to make uh, the impression that nobody is coming to Alaska. In fact, I shared my uh, story about Repsol, which is, has made a very significant investment in Alaska. Uh, and I know there are other companies that, that have made. And, and it is very encouraging to see that they do. And, and, uh, and uh, I'm very really happy for Alaska that that is happening, because that, that needs to happen. Uh, it is still a little bit. I would still qualify it as a relatively modest investment compared to what other nations seem to attract, but uh, uh, you're happy with every new investor that shows up. Uh, there is no question about that. Uh, I absolutely agree with the blending philosophy, uh, the, with, with one uh, major, that you are absolutely correct in saying that uh, the original PPT uh, was designed uh, with this BOE concept in mind. Uh, and that, that BOE uh, concept and that uh, uh, combined price concept and the combined tax value concept uh, would then uh, result in, in cross-subsidization among, among the various uh, resources. Uh, and that you would actually encourage uh, heavy oil production through that. And in fact, I, uh, um, uh, I was not necessarily in favor of the BOE concept, but I was in favor of the tax uh, uh, value concept. Uh, so consequently, uh, that issue is definitely correct. Uh, my analysis shows that it, it really you need wider differences in government take than can be achieved with uh, the processes that you now have under uh, ACES. Uh, also, I do believe that most of the investors uh, that would come for these new resources would be new investors, and new investors would not be benefiting from the blending. So consequently, if you want to attract new investors, uh, then you want to set, the, say, if you want to go to any country in the world and say, come to Alaska to invest in this heavy oil project, then the terms for heavy oil itself need to be attractive, not because it is cross-subsidized from uh, light oil. And that is why I believe that this is a strong concept to bring new investors to, 
to Alaska. But you are absolutely correct. Uh, the blending concept uh, is a valid concept. I don't like the BOE part of it, uh, but otherwise it is a valid concept. And I haven't criticized that concept. I have criticized the BOE concept, but not the blending concept in, in ACES, and I think it is an entirely justified and good concept. And uh, you're absolutely correct that in this architecture uh, you would uh, abandon that. Uh, uh, however, uh, as I said, if the goal is to find new investors for new resources, you cannot blend. Uh, you, you have to make sure that for each resource you have the right government take. Okay. Senator French. A couple questions, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, one, uh, let me ask just on the on your uh, um, on your advice regarding new oil, new light oil. Um, your idea is to lower the tax burden to stimulate investment there. Should that uh, lower rate persist indefinitely into the future, or should you uh, allow for sort of a, a hurried up recapture of your investment, and then once the investment's been recaptured, uh, then um, um, revert to a, a higher tax rate? Um, uh, you could do both uh, uh, as long as you come up with a system that, um, uh, say, um, uh, allows consolidation. I mean, the, the, you shouldn't go for different tax rates, as, as is in the House Bill uh, 110. Could you theoretically have a stronger allowance for five years and then eliminate the, for the first five of years of production and then and then re, reduce it so that it becomes the same? Absolutely you can. That is a variation of the same concept. Uh, the reason that I propose the flat, because the flat is the easiest one, uh, uh, but there are all kinds of variations. Of course, an initial higher allowance for the first seven years, and or, or five or ten, whatever you want to pick, and then eliminating the allowance afterwards so that it merges with the, with the existing rate is also a good concept. Uh, in fact, that concept make, is a little bit less, reduces the front end loading again, so it enhances the rate of return, it enhances the net present value. It's all a matter of figures in the end. Uh, it's slightly more complicated because now you have to start keeping track of each individual field, and, but that's not a major issue if it is just production based. So can you do that? Absolutely. That would be a, a variation of this case. I, uh, the reason that I uh, did not propose it, I want to first propose a simple architecture. It is, it is easy to make variations on this. This system is not optimized. I didn't look for the absolute optimal combination. I didn't have time to, to do that. Uh, but can you make uh, modest variations to this that would kind of optimize uh, the cash flows and optimize the economics? Absolutely. That's uh, my first question. And just one other question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, You've made these recommendations to other states and other uh, governments besides Alaska. Where, where else? Where else have you made these recommendations? I mean, if they're if they're good for Alaska, they're good for other parts of the world. Uh, no, the, the interesting part of the world that everybody seems to be doing things very differently, and you would have to learn to work with the different cultures and the different you know philosophies. Um, uh, uh, interestingly, the structure that I'm recommend that is recommended here, the severance uh, feature structure, is working perfectly in Trinidad and Tobago. And I was consultant in Trinidad and Tobago, and there it is working uh, very nicely. Uh, so, the, in fact, I use the Trinidad and Tobago input feature to to, to generate this in my model. So. Uh, so, so have I recommended this somewhere, and has it been successful? Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, but you know, countries are very different, and and they have different social structures, different objectives, different views, and and you have to be careful. Uh, it is not one. The same system doesn't necessarily work everywhere in uh, uh, all over the world. You have to adjust to local geology, you have to adjust to local legal structure, you have to adjust to local land management practices. Uh, so uh, in the end, fiscal, how you in detail 
uh, structure these fiscal terms uh, is very different per uh, country by country. Interestingly, the severance feature, uh, apart from Trinidad, is interestingly is also used in the, in the new uh, petroleum law of Kazakhstan. So uh, this is not a feature that is, you know, unknown in the world. It, it, is, it is a feature that is being used by other countries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Thomas, excuse me, Wagner. You want to get Thomas in again? <laughs> this used to look at used to call on Thomas area. when I look in that direction. Uh, Dr. Van Mears, you mentioned earlier you talked about Rapsol and the problems that Rapsol had in getting their arms around our tax structure and understanding it, and that uh, you know they not only talked to you, talked to some of our people. What would you say Rapsol would say to a structure similar to what you put forward here? versus our current ACEs, how much more comfort level would they have if they were faced with this type of a structure versus what we have now? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the first part of your question. I was talking about your earlier discussion about Rapsol. Yes. And the fact that they have invested a good amount of money. I'm not sure they've invested $1.2 in Alaska yet. They plan to, yeah. Yeah, they plan to maybe because they're having a little bit of trouble with the tax system themselves. <clears throat> is all, my question was, what would you feel they would feel with a system like this versus ACEs? Oh, uh, this would absolutely be more attractive to them for a new investor because the government take is less uh, on development uh, very significantly. So I think they would be attracted. I haven't talked to them, the system, uh, uh, of course, because uh, this is developed for, for, for here. Did this, uh, so I have a chance to discuss it with them. But uh, I'm pretty sure uh, I know how they did their economics and I know how they decided to come here. Uh, I'm pretty sure they would be quite happy with these terms. And uh, uh, so consequently, that is where I think a new investor would be, would be attracted to this. Now, uh, there is, I did not make slides of all of the simplifications that you could make in the, in the ACES system, which I think is a long list. Uh, but I think that is a very detailed discussion where you have to go through the whole law and, and discuss with lawyers and, and economists and others what, what can be simplified and what can be taken out. And I think if you do that, uh, then uh, you could come up in the end, I hope, with a simple uh, PPT uh, whereby uh, that works for every resource in Alaska and that uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know, an enormous incentive to start uh, increasing oil production again, and and that should be the goal. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another question, Senator Volkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you believe any of the proposals that you're making would would hurt Alaska in any way. In other words, um, you're you're, rec it, you're recommending some cuts to the credits, and do you think that would that would uh, harm our future ex exploration efforts. Uh, you're recommending that we move away from portfolio blending on heavy oil. Would that hurt efforts by the majors currently in Alaska right now to invest in heavy oil? Uh, do you see any downside to what you're proposing? Uh, now, th what I like to do, of course, if you, if you, every time you propose a new system, uh, what you typically do is invite companies to comment on the system, invite investors to comment on the system. Uh, out of those discussions, you discover whether there are certain problems that you really need to think about, uh, and then you can make some adjustments to that. Uh, uh, do I see a downside in removing the 40%? Obviously, that will mean that the, the massive help for exploration is not there. Do I believe that in the end you will get more exploration? Yes, because as we discussed with the major oil companies, where why are they not, uh, I'm not saying that they're not entirely exploring, but why is the level of exploration very little? Uh, why are they exploring very little? Because they cannot see their way through a totally profitable operation, including the development. If with new oil terms, you say, look, 
these are now new oil terms, these are very competitive terms. Uh, who, who knows? Maybe some of the major oil companies say in that case, we're going to drill 10 or 20 exploration wells. I don't know. We have to learn. Uh, so I, I see an enormous incentive for exploration for those companies that actually have the cash and the knowledge to not just do an exploration well, but see it through to development. And that is what Alaska needs. So uh, I, I see uh, restoring the balance between an attractive development on the one hand and an and a somewhat less attractive uh, exploration, uh, I think that is a better balance to get more exploration, particularly from the major oil companies. Now, will somebody that uh, thought he would going to get the 40% tax credit and, and, and was planning to come to Alaska and then discover that it is no longer there, will that person be negative? Absolutely. Uh, so th there is always some, you never have a fiscal system that makes everybody happy, uh, unfortunately. Senator Regan. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, doctor, do you think that your proposed uh, new fiscal terms are, are enough to get us uh, out of what you have been talking the past couple of days, to get us out of harvest mode? Uh, I, I think it is going to be very, very difficult to get the companies out of an harvest mode. Uh, that will be a somewhat longer process. Uh, uh, I think there are, uh, and the main reason is that investments outside Alaska are so attractive that uh, uh, it would be very difficult to, to convince their headquarters to, again, uh, retain say, double or triple investment in Alaska. Uh, they need now their cash for other areas in the world. And, and the, they have large-scale developments in other parts of the world, and they're counting on the Alaska cash to, to partially finance it. Uh, so it will be difficult to turn that around. Um, uh, it will be difficult to give the, new, the oil companies, uh, you know, the sense uh, either that this is going to be stable fiscally. Uh, uh, I don't want to discuss fiscal stability. Uh, I mean, the, 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 but, you know, to give a sense that this is, you know, a stable kind of environment and that this will last, uh, I think they, they would look for that. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it will be very difficult to, to change the attitude. But this would be a very good start. And it, it, it would uh, definitely uh, uh, give the major oil companies a reason to say, look, uh, maybe Alaska is very important for us. Still, for the three major oil companies, the Surti TCF of gas is one of the largest privately held gas resources in this world. Uh, so Alaska remains <coughs> valuable to them uh, in the long term. And consequently, uh, I, I don't want to d say that that if you don't, uh, uh, or that negative, that the reaction will all be negative. Uh, I just think it will be difficult to to change the attitude around. But uh, you have to start somewhere. I do believe that new investors will react very favorably to these terms. Okay, let's go on to the. Next slide, and because we've got an addendum to get done here today. Yes, uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, the uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, if you don't achieve your goals, if if production sta keeps declining with your new terms now, then you have very valuable market information to uh, to adjust your terms further, and now you have actually proof rather than uh, just hypothetical cash flows and philosophy. Now you have the proof of the market that you need to do something to attract more investment. So my summary is, uh, with the appropriate fiscal and contractual framework, I think you can achieve the million barrels a day throughput. You can achieve significant LNG uh, uh, exports. I fully realize, having been since 1996 in Alaska, that this will be politically very difficult to achieve, uh, that there is a major political and fiscal change required. But I also believe that the sooner you start the process uh, to encourage these changes, uh, the better it will be for the long-term future 
of Alaska, particularly uh, to lay the groundwork uh, for a new generation of Alaskans uh, to live uh, in a continuous, prosperous state uh, without being worried whether they may have to find work somewhere else in, in the United States or other parts of the world. And I think uh, that is a very important goal uh, that we need to uh, uh, try to achieve. Okay. With that, we'll move on to the uh, uh, addendum, and then when, he, when Dr. Van Mears is done with that, we'll come back for final questions. The addendum is the following. As I mentioned, I'm fully aware that uh, uh, that uh, you know what I'm proposing is is, is massive change, and that uh, maybe um, this is a bridge too far, as they say, uh, in the short term. Uh, uh, I hope it is not, because as I think, the earlier you start to introduce these kind of changes, the better it will be for Alaska. But uh, uh, also, I was asked uh, to say, now, if we just want to make a modest change to ACES as it is, uh, and, and we don't want to give up so much revenues, uh, what would we do? And so, what I have is here a very simple proposal. If, if uh, you say in the current session we have only so many days left and we like to do something useful, but uh, we, uh, there is not time enough to consider all of the profound changes that you are uh, proposing, you could have an, uh, an interim uh, situation. Uh, what would I then recommend? Now, very simple. Uh, uh, then I simply say, okay, adjust your, uh, uh, very simply, your ACES uh, system that you already have. Make it 0.35 rather than 0.4 change it at $90 rather than 92.5, uh, start the point one, but cap it at 25% uh, total at 130, so that you don't go over the 75% uh, uh, government take. Establish the 20% uh, gross revenue allowance for new oil in this case. So you just have uh, the same uh, scale, uh, but establish a 20% gross revenue allowance and limit the tax credits to 20%, and that's all you need to do. Uh, and now you have a system that I think will promote, uh, the, uh, will retain most of the revenues on existing production, and will, here you see the slides. Uh, actually, and I'd like to apologize for that, I just realized this morning that the green line is, uh, I, t I uh, miss, uh, input it, this green line, the actual green line should be about two and a half percent uh, higher. Uh, so my apologies for that. I will submit a new slide to the, to the uh, an, uh, corrected slide to the uh, committee. Uh, I just discovered this morning that I had taken the wrong file by accident. Uh, but basically that would Alaska, uh, that would allow Alaska to test the whole ID out of this existing and new apply these definitions of existing and new and see how it works. Uh, does the system of uh, uh, a consolidated tax with uh, an existing high rate and a new low rate, does it all work? Uh, and you can test this out with a very modest change to the current uh, ACES system. And you can look at that for half a year or whatever time you want and then uh, if you like, you can make a, the more profound change that, that, that I would recommend. So if, if you like to set a much simpler, much faster, much uh, uh, more immediate uh, agenda, of course this doesn't solve any of the other, other deficiencies, uh, but this will be a good first step. Uh, of course, uh, the proposal would actually achieve quite a bit, it uh, doesn't create a giveaway, uh, uh, say, from existing production. Uh, it provides a stimulus for new production. It uh, doesn't require ring fencing, so it is a far superior concept than H uh, House Bill 110. And it solves four of the five deficiencies that I currently see in ACES. So that is definitely a worthwhile thing to do. It is certainly not uh, as broad and not as certain to uh, achieve, you're not achieving a million barrels a day with it. Uh, at best, you're going to slow down a little bit the decline in the production, but uh, that would then be a first step to, to take. So then you'll redo the, 
the chart on the yeah the, 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 the as I said by accident I imported the wrong uh, the curve so I'll I'll uh, send uh, when I send the breakdown for the government take I will also redo the charts I'm uh, my apologies for that but that's the price you pay if you very early in the morning try to prepare <laughs> slides for the Senate uh, Finance Committee uh, of course, such a bill would not achieve very important um, uh, other issues. It would not repair this uh, BOE problem. Uh, it would not create an architecture to which you can add other resources. Uh, it would therefore not provide the stimulus for heavy oil, oil shale, or natural gas, I think, that, uh, that you need. Uh, so it, is really a very, it would really be a very modest step. But um, if that's all that is politically possible at this point in time, that would also be a very good uh, step to take because it would for sure be a superior concept than House Bill 110. You would protect Alaska better uh, and you would at least make a start uh, with encouraging new oil production. Do we have any uh, questions? Well, I'd like to go ahead and thank uh, Dr. Van Muirs for coming all the way to Sitka to excuse me, to Juno. It should be Sitka if they didn't steal the capital, the dirty dogs. Um, but anyway, uh, certainly appreciate you coming here and helping the Senate Finance Committee the last two days, and we'll work with you on that up, updated slides and, and the answers to the questions, and, and we'll uh, continue through this process, and hopefully we'll be implementing some of these suggestions that you've made as we work forward and try to uh, put Alaska in a more competitive position. Yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, on, on uh, the third page, can we get uh, a breakdown of what the uh, impact would be in uh, dollars to the state treasury for this for this slide? Yes, we can. We can have uh, Dr. Van Meers give us the component parts of the of the um, tax or the government take, and then we can go ahead and, um, and have some analysis run on the economics of it. Holy smokes. That would be great pleasure. Yeah, there is no problem giving the breakdown. Of course, I don't have the databases that DOR has, but I can tell you the breakdown of tax, uh, PPT, and so on. I just had an emergency note handed to me today, or just now, it's Pedro's birthday. <laughs> Your birthday today? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Well, happy birthday. It, it is a wonderful birthday present to be able to harass the Senate Finance Committee. Any <laughs> <laughs> right. other questions? For <laughs> Thank you. Next, uh, next up will be tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., two bills on the agenda, Senate Bill 130, Alaska Native Language Council, Senate Bill 144, State Immunization Program. Bills previously heard, of course, we're going to try to bring back the Governor's Scholarship Program, um, put it back on the table so everybody can take a look at it and set it aside again for a day or so. We are adjourned. Uh, oil downstream of all the production facilities. The drill sites gather the oil, they bring it into big production facilities, it uh, gets its water removed, the gas removed, and then we, we ship it out to the pipeline. We measure it at the, at the downstream of those production facilities. You know this, but yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, um, since the heavy oil would be joining that production stream somewhere uh, uh, above the production facility, uh, how are we going to measure this heavy oil? No, the tradition in, in most uh, measurement practices around the world is that if you have, an, this would be field by field, so this, this is not part of a heavy fuel oil reservoir somewhere, uh, say, in a light oil field, or if the, the, the concept is that DNR would say, for instance, the Polaris the reservoir and field would qualify as heavy oil, all the oil from that facility uh, or from that uh, field would then uh, qualify as heavy oil. Uh, there may be some uh, areas uh, where you uh, would, may have difficulty measuring precisely. Of course, an oil company needs to know how much oil comes 
from certain fields because ownership is different in each of the fields. So they have to have a methodology for uh, calculating back uh, the proper, uh, the proper um, uh, uh, say, uh, volumes. If there is no measurement at the field, the practice all around the world is to uh, establish a, a very simple um, test separator and, uh, and uh, 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 do some test in the field from which you can extrapolate precisely the production from that particular field. That would require an additional investment, but uh, that would certainly be worth it for this particular purpose. Anyway, it is good to know how much you produce field by field. Uh, I mean, that's pretty fundamental information. I do believe uh, that Alaska has sufficient technical capacity to, to identify that. Just a follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that was a good answer. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I guess this is more globally. Uh, one of the difficulties I've had in thinking about your approach to this with different uh, tax rates for different uh, pools and so forth is the degree to which these are all sort of mixed up into one land mass. How much heavy oil do you produce? So many barrels. Multiply it by 15 percent of the value, and that is an extra deduction. That is a very simple concept. Um, now, um, the problem, as I mentioned, the moment you start adding allowances to uh, uh, to credits, the, the problem of a negative PPT uh, pops back up. And consequently, in order to avoid that the state would be out of pocket, uh, the best mechanism to employ is to employ a floor price and say if in the unusual conditions that the oil price drops very much and the state would be out of pocket, then we simply, just for the purposes of, uh, of calculating the PPT, not for uh, other purposes and just for the purposes of, of heavy fuel oil, you would simply have a floor price. And you would say, okay, in that case, the heavy fuel oil component uh, uh, would uh, be calculated never on a price never lower than $55. This will guarantee that there will be always enough uh, revenues, I think, uh, to uh, uh, make up for the uh, tax credits and for the normal tax deductions. Now, this is an initial figure that I estimate uh, you need to do, of course, a little bit more work on this, uh, and you may be able to make it a little bit more sophisticated. But uh, if the moment you start giving, in addition, just as the problem is the 40% tax credit, the moment you start going well beyond the 20% tax credit, you run into the negative PPT problem, and uh, you have to deal with it somehow. And the easiest way to deal is, it with, is a floor price. So, uh, so you would make two simple adjustments to the system for a new pr uh, oil production, establish a 15% allowance, and establish a floor price. And then you have a whole new system that is perfectly uh, attractive for uh, heavy fuel oil and brings you down to the government take level that we uh, discussed before. Okay. Senator French, you had a question. <coughs> Senator Wolkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, where do you suggest we measure that heavy oil in order to apply the uh, appropriate allowance? Right now we measure... Uh, uh, think about uh, what to do in conjunction with additional heavy oil production in order to um, uh, ensure that the total gravity, the total quality of the uh, line, crude in the line, is adequate for transportation. Uh, you can, of course, mix it with condensates. You can uh, uh, <coughs> increase the light oil production. Uh, you can even use GTL from a GTL plant. Uh, so there are many uh, there are many ways to do this. But it is important to to uh, realize that uh, it is very important to uh, balance the uh, the quality of the crude in the line. So you cannot just boost heavy oil production, it has to be part of a broader uh, plan. Maybe before we go to the next slide, we've been joined by Co-Chair Hoffman, Senator Stevens, and Senator Giesel has been in the room. She is also in the room all morning, in the morning session. And uh, we, noted, we noted that the Senate President is late, but she's the President, it's okay. <laughs> go ahead and continue. Uh, oh, and uh, my apologies, uh, Mr. Chairman. There was an, um, uh, I understand, there, there was a written question uh, uh, from uh, Senator Joe Pasquale. Uh, 
um, about the breakdown of the 75% uh, in, in of my, uh, uh, say, existing oil. I don't have a slide for that, uh, but it will absolutely be no problem to provide those uh, figures uh, uh, to the committee so that uh, tomorrow morning I, I will uh, make a special slide about the breakdown of, of the 75%, how it is broken down. Um, now, uh, in the new architecture, um, uh, my suggestion is that, as I indicated, that you need special terms for uh, heavy oil uh, with a lower uh, government take. Um, uh, the current heavy oil production, the current production, what is important to note is there is today already heavy oil production on the North Slope. Uh, about 40,000 barrels a day uh, uh, could be qualified as, as heavy oil production. Um, in principle, you could also apply the logic of existing and new to this heavy oil. I, I would not recommend it, uh, firstly because this is a small part of the production and it would unnecessarily complicate the system, uh, but more fundamentally it, it would be technically not that easy to de determine the, uh, the decline curve for heavy oil at this point in time uh, because uh, uh, many of the reservoirs are still, uh, say, in, in early development. And as I said, secondly, the volume is relatively small. So I, I think in the interest of, of keeping a relatively simple system, uh, I would propose not to divide the, the heavy oil in existing and, uh, and new, but simply make it one class of, of heavy, uh, he heavy oil. That, of course, would result in a benefit, uh, an immediate benefit to those producers that are actually producing the, the heavy oil. Uh, here you see the terms I would produce, uh, I would propose. Uh, you can simply keep the same 25% PPT. You can simply keep the same 20% tax credit. You can also keep simply the same uh, severance tax feature. The only thing with heavy oil is you would start at a higher price, uh, $160 a barrel rather than 60, so that in case oil prices go up very high, uh, then you are protected uh, also uh, uh, with the uh, uh, some price sensitive mechanism. How do you then bring down uh, the government take on heavy oil without creating a ring fence. Now, that is very simple. My suggestion is to introduce what I call a 15% allowance. Now, uh, and the allowance is calculated on the va gross value of the heavy oils. Uh, how is that allowance calculated? Now, very simple. If the oil price is $100 a barrel, uh, they would be able to deduct $15 a barrel before you actually calculate the PPT. So this is an allowance before you calculate the PPT. So they would calculate the PPT based on $85 a barrel, and after that, everything uh, uh, applies. So all you do is one more line on your tax return that simply says... Call Senate Finance Committee to order. Time is three minutes after 1 p.m., February 14th, 2012. With me this afternoon is Senator Ellis, Senator Thomas, Senator Egan from the committee will be, there's other meetings going on, so some of the uh, senators will be coming and going to this process. We've been joined this afternoon with the resource uh, committer, committee. We have vice, excuse me, co-chair, Senator Wagner, uh, Senator Wilkowski, Senator French, and the other members of the committee will uh, come into the room when, when they uh, have a break from their other committee meetings going on. This afternoon, we're going to continue on with the fourth part of four-part series with Dr. Pedro Van Meers. Um, and with that, we can ask the, Dr. Van Meers to uh, put himself on the record and take us through section four. And then there's an uh, uh, addendum at the end of, of this presentation he'll do. That's uh, four or five slides and then we'll have him do a wrap up. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Pedro Van Meers. I'm president of Van Meers Corporation involved in uh, analysis of fiscal systems. 
Um, this afternoon, the idea is to wrap up uh, how you would use the architecture that we uh, discussed for existing oil and new oil. How could that be applied to heavy oil, shale oil, and natural gas in such a way that you get a relatively totally, uh, in total, a relatively easy, understandable uh, system? For heavy oil, uh, what is important is to realize, of course, that um, we cannot just, although I mentioned that uh, the um, uh, matter of, of that, that you need the heavy oil uh, to fill the line, uh, there are, of course, restrictions, uh, probably technical restrictions on how much heavy oil you can put in the line versus how much light oil. Um, and consequently, there are probably, um, uh, in bringing uh, about uh, heavy oil production, uh, you would have to uh, 